Resurrection Pass by Kent Dufault Prologue Shooting someone is the most intimate moment you'll ever experience with another human being. Chapter 1. There'd be hell to pay. He'd heard the money was good, and that was enough for him. Harsh October winds screamed like angry eagles through the valleys to the west. He wasn't one to complain, but the damn bitter cold pierced his flesh like ravaging bullets, tearing at old wounds with venomous claws. He pulled his hat down tight to the collar. The morning mists had turned to sleet, and now, as the last rays of sunshine escaped beyond the mountaintops, snow drifted in the air like the seeds of a warm spring day long forgotten. He leaned tight to his horse and rode into the south end of town. Frozen tobacco and spittle hung from his graying beard. His trained ear took in the dissident click of his horse's hoof. He'd need to see the farrier. He pulled the tattered Stetson down once again, shielding his face further from the cold and also from the view of curious, wandering eyes. Elijah wondered if God had been kind enough to condemn a decent farrier to this hellhole. Probably not, he presumed. He dismounted. He pressed the heel of his left boot lightly to Lemonona's flank. She resisted. His gal got finicky at times when a deep cold set in. The weathered cowboy pulled gently on the reins and absentmindedly stroked the ivory handle of his peacemaker. Threadbare gloves did little to shield his hardened fingers from the bitter cold. He kept his eyes down and his teeth clenched. Wooden shutters to his left and right creaked and groaned against the wind, their latches aching. A dog barked and Winona yanked at her tack. The scarred mutt with a misshapen leg scurried by in search of food. This town felt rotten. It felt of the dead, smelling of decay and hanging on with one last breath. This was a feeling Elijah knew all too well. He stroked Winona's neck in reassurance. Calm down, Winnie, he cooed. She, too, was familiar with the stench of death. A gust of wind barreled down Main Street. Elijah caught a glimpse of the frills of a petticoat catching the wind. Silk stockings clung to young, fresh legs as they scurried from one door to the next. It had certainly been a while, he licked his lip. The thought of a warm bed and a soft woman made almost anything seem worthwhile, at this moment anyway. He brought his palomino Winnie to a halt. Elijah raised his eyes and clenched his teeth again. He set his chin pointed and stern. He read a large white sign as it banged relentlessly against a gray and weathered clapboard building. Sure enough, this was the place. He dismounted and tied Winona to a thick hitching post. Elijah's black leather duster danced wildly in the wind. A boy, known only as Giddy to a few townies, because his real name was Gideon, and he'd never told anyone that, because he was different to be sure, crouched behind a barrel not ten feet from the tall stranger. Giddy's eyes widened. He saw two ivory-handled six-shooters twist on the man's gun belt. One aside, all shiny and glistening. They were pretty. He could see that all right, even as the dust and snow whipped around his small, squarish face, forcing him to a hard squint. The guns lay nestled into black leather holsters. They were supple and worn from use. Giddy thought they looked like the part of his body, attached like another arm or a leg. Each holster was capped with a bright silver circle that looked like money to his eager eyes. Giddy couldn't quite make out what the silver circles were, but if they were money, he could thieve them up. For a moment, Giddy pondered that thought. They looked like the petals of a flower. Maybe they were Mexican reales. He put that thieving idea aside for the moment and counted up ten bullets neatly in a row on the near side of the holster, like little soldiers clinging to the man for their lives. The man's pants looked Yankee, probably fought in the war. The man glanced his way and Giddy's stolen breakfast almost ran clear through him. He clamped his hand to his mouth. The wind rattled hard again and the Palomino whinnied. If the stranger heard him, he didn't play his hand. The boy slid to the left, leaving only a small brown eyeball peering out from behind a water barrel. The stranger strode past him toward the door. His spurs jingled 
like sweet bells as he stepped through the entrance of Carl the Carlsbad building. The heavy wooden door slammed shut, leaving the boy alone outside. Giddy jumped up and splashed through some mud as he ran to the back of the building. There'd be hell to pay if he weren't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. Chapter 2 Most thought the Indian was stupid. He knew better. Elijah stood tall inside the doorway. The room was small and sparse. On first glance, whoever it was running this show didn't look so well to do. That bothered him a bit. He'd be getting his money up front, that's for damn sure. He flared his duster outward to cover his guns before stomping his warm boots once or twice. It was warm inside, and the snow began to melt, dripping onto the plank floor. His eyes just strutted over to a wood burner and pulled off his gloves. He warmed himself without uttering a word. A, ma a small man sat behind a desk at the far end of the room. He was dressed in a poorly made suit and smelt of whiskey. Elijah reckoned he was a wheezy-looking little fella. The man coughed. May I help you? Elijah didn't answer, and the man looked up nervously. He asked again, Can I help you, mister? He shifted in his seat. He took notice that the tall stranger was wearing parts to a Yankee uniform. He also stunk of the trail, smelled of a long journey, and perhaps gunpowder, perhaps death. The older man's name was Abraham Carlsbad, and he didn't know which was which with this tall stranger. But he did figure one thing. This Yankee was likely trouble. Carlsbad slipped his right hand into an open desk drawer and wrapped several pudgy fingers around the rosewood grip of a double-barreled Danger 95. This particular pistol weren't worth much beyond ten feet. After that, you likely couldn't hit an oak tree that was as wide as a carriage house. However, there weren't no ten feet between him and this stranger. A stranger standing by his fire, by the way, and by golly. If he had to, Abraham could and would put a bullet or two into the man's chest. He knew damn well that doing so would likely only put a fire in the stranger's heart. He'd seen men of this nature, Civil War vets, nothing more than the living dead. The stranger would likely end up killing him anyway. He loosened his grip from the weapon. We ain't got no money here, Abraham stuttered. That right, Elijah muttered back. That ain't what I heard. Well, what did you? Elijah turned to face the older man, but he didn't lead the wood burner. Looks at this place, I'm inclined to believe you. Name's Elijah Stone. He reached under the duster with his left hand. Abraham flinched, quickly slipping his hand back into the drawer. The gunman stopped and studied the older man's eyes. I'd best be putting my hands up on that desk, mister. I ain't here to cause no trouble. I'm looking for a job. Stone slowly pulled his hand out from under his jacket. He clutched a ragged section of newspaper. He strolled over to Abraham's desk and threw it down. Carlsbad wiped several beads of sweat from his balding head before picking it up. There was a circled headline. It read, Cheyenne Journal, October 30th, 1888. Needed. Good man with a strong will to deliver a package from Buffalo in the Wyoming Territory to Helena in the Montana Territory. Must have a clear head, a patient soul, and be good with a gun. Good pay for the right fella. Inquire at Carlsbad and Son, Attorneys at Law, Buffalo, Wyoming. Abraham laid down the clipping and removed his wire glasses. Yes, Mr. Stone, my name is Abraham Carlsbad, and indeed we are still looking for a good man to complete the job. You uh, feel you meet the qualifications? Stone stretched. His neck made an abrupt popping sound that rang out across the room. In his right hand, he held the brim of his campaign hat. It shook a little. His left was steady enough. It currently rested on the pearl handle of his colt. He walked over to a framed paper that hung on the wall and stared at it. It was some fancy script saying Carlsbad had a title. To Stone, that only meant one thing. He had money somewhere. Little Pecker probably had it buried in a hole in the backyard somewhere. Wouldn't be here if I didn't, Stone replied to the question. Yes, and have you been in trouble with the law, mister? Just call me Stone. Don't much care for complications or titles. Well, have you ever been arrested, Mr. Stone? I mean, Stone. Have you ever been arrested, Stone? None I'll admit to, Elijah smiled. Tobacco-stained teeth made him look more menacing than he actually lived in his heart. Truth was, most folks were just plain scared of him, and he knew it. It was just the way he carried himself. He'd seen his fair share of scrapes and jams. He'd killed and been shot at. 
weren't much worth being afraid of anymore, including jail. That's how he saw it. Hmm. Carlsbad put his glasses back on and scribbled some notes. Are you prone to rage? he asked quietly. Silence flooded the room. Carlsbad tapped his quill pen on the desk. Another bead of sweat formed on his brow. He didn't dare look up. Stone moved to another framed picture further down the wall. He guessed it was Carlsbad and his son. Son looked like he ain't never done a lick of work on his own, Elijah thought. He stared at the image momentarily. I carry myself evenly, he responded. But I do believe in an eye for an eye, and I ain't one to stand by and let someone else get the first poke. He turned and looked at the older man. Carlsbad dropped his pen. He reached over and lifted a smoking pipe from a wooden cradle. It was carved to appear as an eagle in flight. He lit the pipe and leaned back. Are you familiar with the territory between here and Helena? Quite, Stone responded. I fought under Generals Dodge and Cook along the Bozeman Trail. Whoa, you must have been quite a young fellow, Carlsbad puffed heavily. The sickly sweet odor of cherry tobacco filled the room. Old enough to pull a trigger. I know the ways of the Lakota and the Cheyenne. How about the Navajo? Never met me a Navajo. Didn't venture into the New Mexico Territory. But I imagine an Indian is an Indian. You got your good ones and your bad ones. I ain't gonna lie, mister. I killed my share of men, white and red. But I ain't never killed a man that didn't have it coming. And now that the wars are over, I ain't gonna kill no one for the color of his skin. So if this job's about shooting Indians, you got the wrong fella. Abraham nodded in acknowledgement. Those look like fine weapons. He gestured at the six shooters on Elijah's hips. Best a man can afford. I can assume that you are, shall we say, handy with them. I could shave the, shave the hair off your ears from here if you'd like. Abraham stiffened in his chair. Well, that won't be necessary, Mr. S Stone. Can you please just, can I please just call you Mr. Stone? Habits are hard to break. I shall say that I believe you are a man who says what he means and means what he says. Appreciate that confidence, mister. And yeah, you can tack a mister on there if it makes you feel better. Well, you can relax, Mr. Stone. This job does not require the butchering of Indians. Elijah pulled out a pouch from under his belt. He opened the drawstring and removed his own wooden pipe. It was smaller than Carlsbad's, with an ivory lip piece and a bowl carved with the detail of running horses. He packed it with his thumb and then lit it with a wooden matchstick. A quick shake of the wrist doused the flame and he threw it onto the floor. An even sweeter, more sickening smell of tobacco filled the room. Carlsbad unconsciously arched an eyebrow. The two men smoked in silence. Elijah studied the room. The furnishings were simple. There was a small bar against the far wall. It was decorated with several pieces of oriental art. Probably stole it off the railroad, Chinese, Elijah mused. There were also several crystal goblets and some silver serving ware on the bar. There's money here, trying to hide it. Stone puffed on his pipe, contemplating <clears throat> how he was going to relieve Carlsbad of a good handful of his precious cash. Gold would even be better. Carlsbad stood and walked over to the bar. A drink, Mr. Stone? Much obliged, it had cleared the trail from my throat. Carlsbad poured them each a brandy. He handed one to Stone. The older man exhaled deeply, and a rush of warm air blew across the glass before he sipped his brandy. Stone smoked his pipe and waited. He was a patient man. There was a reason he had stayed alive under General Cook. Fetterman, Fetterman's massacre. No one made it out except him. While most of the boys in blue were young, pig-headed, and convinced that the Indian was stupid, Elijah knew better. Chapter 3. The Not-So-Sanctimonious Sister Mary Her eyes drifted across yellow paper. The worn leather cover that she held in her long fingers had cracked with stress. Sister Mary blinked and read, Leviticus 26.7, And ye shall chase thine enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Mary put the book down and contemplated. She'd killed, and would likely kill again. There were concerning prospects to this passage. How do I know who the enemy is, for sure, she said. That can be a slippery slope, she whispered again. Also, when you are killing for the Lord, and when you are killing just because it suits you. She reckoned she'd done both of those as well. She put the book down. 
Mary reached over and picked up one of her revolvers. The small wooden door to the back room swung open. Giddy stood there with his hands in his pockets. Sister Mary had leaned forward on her stool. Her legs were spread, pulling the folds of a wear-worn dress to her sides. Her right elbow rested on her thigh. Giddy stared at the milky flesh of Sister Mary's thigh. At first, he didn't notice her waving the barrel of her gun back and forth. It wasn't until she pulled the hammer back, making the distinct cocking sound that was so familiar to those looking at the business end of a peacemaker, that he looked up into her dark brown eyes. They stared for a moment. Giddy stammered, There's a gunslinger. There's a gunslinger out front. That right, Mary responded. Giddy shook his head. What's a gunslinger doing out front? Giddy shrugged. He rode up from the south, come down Main Street, tied up, and went in to see Mr. Carlsbad. Mary grinned. Giddy couldn't say Carlsbad, no matter how hard the poor kid tried. She tried to get him to spit it out. Carlsbad. Giddy's eyebrows frowned. That, that's what I said. Mary laid the pistol down before letting the hammer slowly back into the safe position. She adjusted her dress and sat up straight. Why do you think this person isn't a man, Giddy? He shook his head. Why do you think this man is a gunslinger? The boy rubbed his chin and thought, Miss Mary, sometimes you just know. Her eyes twinkled. She knew of the boy's troubles. She knew that the days that lied ahead would be dangerous. She anticipated that things might be, well, especially difficult for the boy. The church, rather Father Riley, had laid it out for her. He was a bit of a renegade, much like she was. He felt that they could save this boy. The bishop would likely just have the boy shot and buried. That's how they operated. Sister Mary liked the boy, and that made all of it that much harder to swallow. Giddy began to stammer, which he often did when he was nervous. He, he carries a set of pestolas, just like yours, sister. That's so. Yep, yep, except they got, they got ivory handles. Hmm, sounds like a gunslinger has good taste. Come here. She held out her hands. Giddy walked over, and she pulled him in close to her chest. She liked being close to him. It helped her to focus. She felt his warm breath on her neck, just below the chin. In moments like this, he felt normal enough. A tiny woman with gray hair peeked around the corner to the back room. It was Mrs. Carl's bed. Abraham would like to see you, she said, but for the moment, leave the boy here. Mary stood and set Giddy up on her stool. You wait here, she said. She picked up her gun belt and strapped it on. Giddy noticed a mark on the handle nearest to him. It was an engraving of a cross. Chapter 4, When Gunslingers Meet Sister Mary entered the room and Carlsbad stood. Stone did not, at least not at first. He eyed the younger woman with the same intensity he might judge the value of a thoroughbred horse. Then he stood. Stone was the first to speak. Sister, unusual to see a woman of God strapping a gun belt. Carlsbad stepped forward and put out his arms. Sister Mary, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Elijah Stone. Mr. Stone has answered our call for help. Mary extended her hand. Mr. Stone, it's a pleasure to meet you. Sister Mary Gallagher, Sisters of Charity out of Santa Fe in the territory of New Mexico. And judging by the looks of you, I'd say you'd be a damn Yankee. Stone broke into a wide tobacco-stained grin. Well, you'd be correct, sister. You can drop the sister and just call me Mary, Mr. Stone. And you can drop the mister and just call me Stone, Mary. The three stood in silence. Carlsbad's eyes darted back and forth. Well, Abraham stammered, now that we have satisfied the introductions, perhaps we should sit, have a whiskey, and discuss the job at hand. Don't mind if I do, Mary brushed past Stone and took a chair he had occupied. Stone's toothy smile returned. He generally liked a woman with spunk. Carlsbad spud nervously on his heels. Mr. Stone, take mine, please. He walked behind his desk and pulled out the wooden chair he had occupied earlier. He positioned it so that the three of them sat in a circle before walking over to a whiskey decanter and pouring two whiskeys. Uh, you can make mine a double, Mary said. Carlsbad looked back at her momentarily before pulling out a third glass and filling it half full. Stone leaned back in his chair. You don't mind me saying, ma'am, you don't seem like no nun I've come across. Now she smiled. Why, thank you, Stone. You have no idea. Some of God's work, well, it's not as clean cut as one might assume. That's so, he replied. Chapter 5. 
Death on the Dusty Plains of Western Texas. Gideon, Gideon was the only name the boy had ever known. However, that wasn't his birth name. You see, the boy was a half-breed, and that spelled bad news for anyone in 1888. Even though the Indian Wars were generally declared as over, there was a failing on the part of the white man's er- that was a failing on the part of the white man's arrogance. The Navajo and the Sioux were just getting warmed up, and the Apache, well, the Apache just never gives up. The white man, for the most part, hated the Indian, and an Indian's opinion of the white man was, well, much worse. The truth was, Gideon didn't know his birth name, as his Indian mother had been slaughtered in the Red River War in 1878. Hold on, Clary. I'm making you something. I'll let you know when I'm done. Love you. Truth was, Gideon didn't know his birth name, as his Indian mother had been slaughtered in the Red River War in 1875. Strangely, she wasn't Cheyenne, but Navajo. She'd been sent to western Texas, along with a delegation from the rogue group of from a rogue group of the Free Navajo Nation that had yet to be rounded up and stuck on a reservation in New Mexico. They wished to join the remaining Navajo and Cheyenne forces against the white man in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The delegation never made it back. Her name was Anaba, which in Navajo means she returns from war. Anaba was a special woman, fierce and gifted with a spiritual nature that had been passed on to her that had been passed on to her half breed son. While the spiritual nature was revered within the Navajo nation, it was more or less feared by everyone else. Even the Apache warrior would give Anaba a wide berth. But even her spiritual nature could not protect her from the overwhelming numbers of the white man and his ever more potent weapons. Only Anaba knew that her son was fathered by a white man. He was a drunk trapper passing through northern Arizona, and she was young. She had wandered away from the group of Navajo she was traveling with. He caught her already naked by a stream bathing. Anaba was gifted with a warrior spirit, but even that could not save her from a mountain man more than twice her size. She had been raped a fact that she took to her death with the exception of a few tribal leaders. In the early years of the white man's incursion, a half-breed child would have been put to death or turned out to the tribe along with the mother. As time wore on, tribal leaders had softened on that, although, as in most of these situations, a half-breed child would likely face many hardships, even within his own tribe. Given Anaba's special nature and the fact that the child appeared more Navajo than not, Gideon's life would have, been, would have paralleled any of the other male children in his tribe right up until his, mo- his mother died on a battlefield. Beginning around 1864, the majority of the Navajo nation became enslaved by the white man. 9,000 Navajo men, women, and children were forced to walk over 300 miles to Fort Sumner, New Mexico, for internment at Bosque Renando. About 5,000 of them survived that walk. In addition, a group of Mescalero Apaches had also been relocated to Bosque Renando and these two tribes were long-time mortable enemies. This resulted in constant skirmishes and violence. Between 1864 and 1868, numerous Navajo were killed, tortured, raped, and or died of malnutrition due to the poor management and protection of the United States Cavalry. This period was known among the Navajo as the Fearing Time. In 1868, the Treaty of Bosco Renando was negotiated between the Navajo leaders and the United States federal government. This treaty allowed the remaining Navajos to leave Bosco Redondo and return to a reservation on a portion of their former homeland in northeastern Arizona. Through all of these years of conflict and tribulation, bands of Navajo would escape and form up parties when they could. This was Anaba's story and how she came to birth the boy known as Giddy and how she came to die on the dusty plains of western Texas.
Chapter 6, The Task at Hand The three of them sat in silence until Carlsbad spoke. Well, now that the introductions are out of the way, perhaps we should get to, into the task at hand. Mr. Stone, the job I'm hiring is for you to accompany Sister Mary and her charge across the Wyoming Territory and into Montana for a safe arrival at the destination of Helena. Stone shifted slightly. Let me get this right, he responded. You want me to take this, the sister here, cross hundreds of miles of Indian territory, through the mountains, on the verge of winter snow, all the way to Helena? He snorted and tossed the balance of his whiskey into his throat. That's right, Carlsbad replied. Listen, mister, Mary butted in. I can handle myself and the boy. Whoa, right there. A boy? Yes, the boy. I said transport the sister and her charge. Carlsbad cleared his throat. The boy. Stone chuckled. He lifted a single finger on his left hand and wiggled it. Sister, Stone leaned forward and looked Mary directly in the eye. I mean no disrespect, and I'm sure you know your way around a convent. But what we are suggesting here is what we used to refer to in the Union Army as a suicide order. Mr. Stone, I have managed to get us this far, and that was with the partial accompaniment of a gunslinger such as yourself who didn't make it. Elijah looked at both of them. What do you mean he didn't make it? I mean he didn't make it. What, he took off, he got sick, he got drunk, broke a leg? He's dead, Mary's eyes twinkled slightly. Stone handed his glass to Carlsbad and nodded, before wiggling his finger again, this time indicating more whiskey was in order. Carlsbad stood and obliged him. Stone turned his attention to the pretty nun. For a second time, he sized her up. Where you come from, he asked. Pecos, New Mexico. Pecos? Near Santa Fe? That's got to be damn near 800 miles, mostly Apache territory. That's right, and here we sit. Mr. Stone, this leg of the journey is half that distance, and we are willing to pay you more than your predecessor. Well, sure you are. We got to cross the Rockies, and we got to do it while sneaking past the Cheyenne, the, Cro the Crow, and the Lakota. Mr. Stone, the Indian wars are over. Elijah took his glass from Carlsbad and sipped. Yeah, well, maybe you ought to tell that to them. Carlsbad looked at Mary. I am authorized to increase the ante, Mr. Stone. Let's say upon safe delivery, you are given a bonus of an additional 50% of the agreed-upon fee. The older man's eyebrow raised. This was a tell whenever he negotiated, which also led to his lousy ability as a poker player. Wait a minute, Mary cut in. Now she stood and pointed a long, delicate finger at the gunslinger. How do we even know he's capable? She moved the finger towards Carlsbad, who shrunk back into his chair. You hired the last man who proved to be almost worthless. He came with excellent credentials, Carlsbad countered. Well, when it came down to it, the man was worthless as a toadstool on horse shit. Elijah chuckled. What are you laughing at, Sister Mary glared. I've ventured past a few nuns in my day, and you are something else. You got the spunk of a New England private standing on one wobbly leg and only one ball left in his musket. Sit down, sister. We'll get my, to my credentials in a second. I got a few questions. First of all, what happened to that last man? How did he die? I'd rather not get into the details. Please don't, Carlsbad muttered. Mary threw a hard look at him. But let's just say it was an Indian-related event. Stone yawned. Why am I not surprised? His head stuck on an Apache or a Comanche war spear somewhere? Something like that, Mary replied. Who's the boy? Our journey started at the Pecos Benedictine Monastery. The boy was a ward. He's ill, and the church hopes to help him. We have specialists in Helena. Stone's eyes searched for honesty in the woman's face. You expect me to believe the church has specialists in Helena? There ain't nothing but brawling booze and cattle trails up there. What better place for a church, he responded. You're going to have to give me something better than that, sister. Sister Mary handed her glass back to Carl's bed. Another double. As he stood, she turned back towards the gunslinger. How long has it been since you were in Helena, Mr. Stone? He shifted and sighed. Mm, number of years, ten, maybe fifteen. My years in Montana were bloody. Don't quite remember. Well, I see. Things are changing. Montana is on the verge of statehood. The church has chosen Helena as a point of departure for activities moving west. We now have a significant presence there, including specialists. And that's all you need to know. Stone sized her up. What's wrong with the boy? That is private information. 
I need to know what I'm dipping my toes into. He pulled out his pipe and began stuffing it with tobacco. The boy's illness is private. It will not affect your job. Carlsbad handed her the whiskey. Unless you are incapable of performing your duties, such as in the case of Robert Storm. Stone looked at her. The man with his head on a spear? Exactly, she replied. Well, I would like to meet the boy. Carlsbad cleared his throat. Exactly. That's a good idea. However, I would ask that Mr. Stone take leave at the hotel, on me, of course, have a bath and a meal. He can meet the boy, and perhaps in the morning. Mary smirked. I'm not convinced this son of a bitch can do the job. Carlsbad winced. And since the church is footing the bill here, I want some proof Mr. Stone can handle a situation. Mary looked at Stone defiantly. <coughs> <clears throat> he puffed on his pipe. Well, what would you suggest, he responded. She reached into a pocket of her habit and produced a bag of silver coins. The bag flew through the air and landed on Stone's lap. She smiled. Let's take this outside. Chapter 7. The Credentials A crowd had gathered. The snow had ceased to fall, and a slightly warming sun brought out everyone to see what the commotion was about. Most of the folks in town had seen Sister Mary around since her arrival weeks earlier, but no one knew the handsome stranger with the pearl-handled peacemakers. Mary loudly cleared her throat. I need 24 volunteers to help me prove that this here gunslinger ain't who he says he is. We're going to see how he shoots. We're going to see if he can outshoot a nun. A murmur rolled through the crowd like a slowly drifting fog bank. Women pulled their bonnets down tight and rolled their eyes. The men had disbelief in their hearts. How could a sister of faith challenge this gunslinger, they thought? The man clearly was a veteran of the Civil War, and despite his rugged good looks, he looked meaner than a starving two-legged grizzly and colder than a weak old corpse. Stone stood quietly for a moment, <coughs> and then he bellowed, What's wrong with you people? The sister here needs volunteers! Slowly, a crowd moved forward, mostly young men who undoubtedly hadn't learned that curiosity could kill the cat, or maybe they just wanted to catch a whiff of a woman in, who, in their minds, was too pretty to be the wife of Christ. My, oh, my, she smelled good one boy mouth to his friend. Mary handed each volunteer one coin, she, <clears throat> one silver coin. She then separated them into two groups of twelve. One group of twelve stood in the street facing north, and the other stood facing south. Mary planted her hands on her hips. If you ain't in the volunteers, get the hell off the street, she shouted. The crowd moved back. She turned back to Stone. He puffed quietly on his pipe. So here's the challenge. Mr. Carl Bad here is going to yell, go. And when he does, each group will toss their coins straight up in the air. We each got our two peacemakers. That's 12 shots each. One shot per coin. If you can outshoot me, Mr. Stone, then the church agrees you are the man for the job and you will be paid according to the terms you set by Mr. Carlspad. <coughs> and if not, we'll keep looking. You ain't the man for the job. Now, which direction do you want? Stone handed his pipe to a young girl of around 18 years who gasped at his touch. He winked at her. I'll take north. Figures, Mary scuffed. Wind's coming from that direction. Gives you an advantage. Sister Mary closed one eye, licked a finger, and held it up over her head. Fine, Stone sighed. I'll take south. Nope. You called it. Mary took up a position about ten feet behind her group, facing to the south. Toss them pieces of silver high, she yelled. I don't want to blow any of your heads off. Stone strolled over to his group. He held out his arms, indicating for them to move into a tighter group in front of him. He whispered, Throw those coins straight up, straight as an arrow. Soon as you do, drop to the ground. An older man turned to him. I can't drop to the ground. I got me a bum leg. Stone put a strong hand on the man's shoulder and moved him to the outside edge of his group. You'll be fine here. Let that coin go and don't move. You hear me? Don't move. Stone centered himself behind his group and took a step back. All right, he said. Let's get this pissing contest over. No offense, sister. None taken, she replied. <coughs> Carlsbad motioned to the crowd to move back even further. He didn't need any dead bodies on his hand. He then cleared his throat. On the count of three and then go. One. Two, three, go! Twenty-four coins flew into the air, and the bodies dropped in unison. Guns were pulled, and multiple blasts rang hard on the ears, with several small children beginning to cry, and their mothers grabbing them hard so they wouldn't get in, get in the way. The entire shootout lasted less than several seconds. Stone's group was coughing and hacking from the smoke. 
They picked themselves up and began searching for the coins. The gunslinger noted a quietness from the nun side of the street. He turned and looked. She was already she was already facing him with her guns holstered and her guns re and her hands resting on the handles. His head cocked slightly. There weren't a lick of smoke around her. Her group already had their coins and were handing them to Carlsbad. Smokeless gunpowder, she said. I can see, he replied. Church must have them some deep pockets. Not only is smokeless gunpowder almost impossible to come by, it's as expensive as hell. Well, we like to think it's heaven, not hell. Stone smiled before nodding in agreement. He walked over to the young woman holding his pipe and stroked her raven black hair. He leaned over and whispered into her ear. She blushed. He took the pipe and began to smoke once again. All of the coins had been gathered and handled to Carlsbad. He nervously looked around the crowd. An accounting is complete. <coughs> Sister Mary hit 11 of 12 coins. A wave of astonishment rolled over the crowd. Mr. Stone hit, he paused. Mr. Stone hit 12 of 12 coins. A cheer rose from the street. Clapping was heard as far out as the Pixie livery and stable on the other end of town. Mary walked over to Stone and held out her hand. He took it and they shook. Congratulations, gunslinger, she said. The church deems you worthy. Work out the details with Carlbad. You can meet the boy tomorrow. She spun on her boots and strode confidently into the Carlsbad office. Carlsbad slipped all the coins into a small leather pouch and tucked it into his vest pocket. He pointed down the street. You'll find the stable down at the far end of town, Mr. <clears throat> Stone. It's run by a man named Pixley. He's a good man. The hotel is at the center of town. I will make arrangements for you, and the fees will be covered. Same goes for the saloon across the street. Everything will be paid. Enjoy yourself and prepare for the trip. Obliged. Stone walked over to Winnie and untied her. His worn boot went into the stirrup, and he effortlessly pulled himself up into the saddle. The crowd parted as the Palomino made her way down Main Street. Carlsbad watched for a moment and then returned to his office. Mary was back in one of the three chairs that they had previously occupied. She had a freshly poured whiskey. Carlsbad sat down opposite her, their eyes locked. That poor bastard has no idea what he's getting into, he said. True enough, she replied. I think he's the right choice. The man can shoot. He's got hard, trade mile, hard trail miles. <coughs> one, way, one way or another, I gotta get this boy to Helena. Carlsbad shook his head. True enough, he replied. Chapter 8. The Winds Tell Stories Stone dismounted after entering through the fence on the westward side of the Pixley building. It was quiet, not much activity. He noticed three boys sleeping in a pile at the base of his stairs that led to a door. There was a large sliding barn door to the left of the boys. He led Winnie toward that door. As the, at the doorway, there was a distinct odor of burning metal and freshly tossed straw. So, they have a smithy, he thought. Good time to give Winnie a once-over. Hopefully he's got farrier duties, and Carlsbad can cover it, as he apparently liked to say. He was about to enter the barn when the door above the boys opened. They all jumped to their feet and scrambled into the barn. An older man, probably in his late fifties, mostly bald and with a scruff beard, shuffled down the steps. He walked past Stone and cupped his hands to his lips. Damn kids, get to work, goddammit! He turned and looked at the gunslinger through tiny eyes. A spit. He then spit a huge wad of pasty black tobacco onto the ground. Kids today, they don't want to earn their keep. I'll pay them some, give them a roof, food. What do they want? They sleep on me. Stone said nothing at first. Then he said, they can't be more than seven, eight, ten years old. Well, ain't you something, Pixley responded. They ain't all, they's all the kin of whores left to fend for themselves when they could barely walk. Stone looked at him. Whores I've known tend to fend for their offspring. In fact, whores I've known tend to be quite protective. The older man looked at him again. They're dead, mister. These whores is dead. Head creepers in these parts got a pretty short lifespan, if you know what I'm saying. Stone knew exactly what he meant. A woman out here lying on her back for a living tended to have a mean and short life. Oftentimes the woman's handler will take on with the kids. He couldn't help but wonder if Pixie was the handler, although he didn't look the type. He patted Winnie on the neck. I need you to take care of Winnie for a day or two. I'd like your smithy to take a look at her. Looks like uh, we go, looks like we'll be riding north into Montana, likely to hit winter in the mountains. Just so as you know, the gent down the way at Carlsbad said he'll be covering your fees. I see. You, uh, you the gunslinger he's been looking for? 
That's why I heard all that gunfire. You shoot somebody? Stone eyed the old man with a toothy grin. As much as I like to, no, I didn't shoot nobody. You out pissing bullets into the air with that nun? Now that caught Stone's attention. As a matter of fact, yes. Why do you ask? You ain't the first. More like, I don't know, more like the twelfth. Stone cocked his head, the brim of his hat lowered to his eyes. You mean to tell me that nun outshot a dozen men? Pixley shook his head. Don't let that booty, don't let that beauty fool you. She tough and meaner than the old dog I keep out back. Stone chuckled. He handled, 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 bleh. He handed Winnie's grains to Pixley, who promptly called out to a boy named David. David was the oldest of the three that had been sleeping at the stairs. Pixie handed the reins to the boy. This mount's named Winnie. Give her water and then brush her down. Tell old Tom out back that he's got a customer for some shoeing. The boy shook his head and walked Winnie into the barn. You treat them boys well, Stone asked with an edge that could cut. I ain't no orphanage, Pixley replied. But yeah, I try to give them a home, a chance, better than anything else they got out here. Stone knew that was the truth, but these boys still likely endure daily beatings. Well, I'll be put up at the hotel for a few days if you need me, Stone said. Hey, mister, Pixley called back. Stone looked at him. You traveling with the nun and that boy to Montana? Looks like, Stone replied. You be careful, mister. The winds tell stories. They tell me stories in my quiet time. The boy is, well, the boy is different. Can't place my finger on it, but you be careful, mister. Stone's eyebrows raised. Sure, I'll be careful. He walked away. His boots kicked up dust on Main Street as he headed toward the hotel. The winds tell stories, he muttered to himself. Must be talking about the weather. The boy thought, that's the least of my worries. Chapter 9. Maddie Hood in the Western Cross Hotel Stone was well aware of the dozens of eyes that followed his path down the street toward the hotel. When he reached his destination, he cussed himself, as he had left some of his belongings in Winnie's side saddle, as well as his repeater. He was sure the livery man would take care of it. He'd send somebody back. He looked up at the hotel. It was a two-story clapboard building. The main level was fairly plain from the outside. There were a couple steps that led up onto a boardwalk that stretched the entire width of the building and wrapped around one side to the back. The second level also had a walkway. It was about the same size, but more ornately decorated. There was a heavy lattice, there was a heavy oak lattice side rail to prevent drunks or youngins from taking a spill from that second story. The lattice also ran up the five support posts to the street side that held up a roof so that customers could stand out in the rain without getting wet. The whole building was whitewashed with the exception of a large sign built over the second story that read Western Cross Hotel. He noticed several young women on the far end of the second story porch that were giggling and smiling at him. He tipped his hat and smiled back. There are worse things out there out here than a handsome gunslinger for these wanton girls. Stone already had his mind on one. He stepped up onto the boardwalk and strode over to the double door. He was also a heavy wood. The type was, un was unfamiliar to him, though. If he had known, it was California Redwood. The door swung open easily, and he stepped inside. It wasn't the worst place in the world to spend a day or two. And that, my love, is how far I've gotten with my story. <laughs>